but she's going to get one anyway. <laughs> Heather McClanahan has been Executive Director of the Los Alamos Historical Society for eight years. A native New Mexican, she spent 14 years in exile in Iowa and Florida before <laughs> returning to her beloved land of enchantment and her husband's hometown of Los Alamos. She has degrees in journalism, political science from Drake University, and a master's in U.S. history from the University of South, Cal South Florida. She is married to Los Alamos native Bob McClanahan, and they are the parents of three young adults, all of whom are going in the technical fields instead of liberal arts. <laughs> Heather is passionate about sharing stories of Los Alamos, from the ancestral Pueblo people to the homestead era, the Los Alamos Ranch School, and of course the Manhattan Project. Now Heather didn't really burst on the scene as executive director eight years ago. She has a long history with the society. When I first came onto the board of directors in 2005, she was a part-time employee working on website development. She grew, learned a lot of history over the time, eventually becoming assistant to Hedy Dunn, our previous director, and then stepped in when Hedy retired. She oversaw great changes in the society. We, she, was, she was instrumental in the partnership with the county to move the archives from Photo Lodge to the new municipal building. She was a major part of the History is Here campaign, our fundraising campaign several years ago, which resulted in the acquisition of the Beta House and the renewal of all the exhibits in the History Museum. And she was instrumental in the legis passing of the legislation of Manhattan Project National Historical Park. Throughout all this, she's represented the society in local, state, and national committees, events, and truly became the face of the society. So please help me welcome my longtime colleague and friend, Heather McClanahan. you all for being here tonight. This is truly an honor. Let's see if I can get this. There we go. This is what we're going to be talking about tonight. A lot of things, a lot of history. The purpose of the talk is to make sure that we are all aware of important stories and issues, and it's going to provide a little bit of direction for you. First, though, I am going to ask your indulgence. I would like to end and begin this talk with two very personal stories. In October of 1999, we had been in Los Alamos for about five months, had two toddlers at home, and I swear to God I was this much pregnant with Catherine, our baby, when I saw an advertisement in the newspaper that the Historical Society was sponsoring a lecture about how Los Alamos became a county. And I thought, I'd really like to know that information. I said, honey, I'm going to go to this lecture, take care of the babies. And for the first time, I walked into this building. And I will never forget that moment because it took my breath away and it brought tears to my eyes. And I sat through Marjorie Bell Chambers' entire lecture just doing this. And I'm sorry, I don't remember what she said, but I have read her book three times. So <laughs> hopefully that makes up for it. And, and I was just, I was so breathtaking by this building. <clears throat> and I rushed home that night. Don't tell me this is killing quitting on us. I rushed home that night and I said, honey, why didn't you ever tell me about Fuller Lodge? It is one of the most beautiful buildings I have ever seen. And he kind of shrugged his shoulders and he said, I grew up with it. I thought everybody had one. <laughs> he knows better. Well, a few weeks later, there was another advertisement in the newspaper and it said that the Fuller Lodge Preservation Board was searching for members, volunteers. And I now had three babies at home, and I said, you know, I've got a little bit of time I can volunteer. 
I'm going to do that because it's going to give me an opportunity to be in that building and to take care of that building. And so I volunteered for the county's preservation board. And through that, met Hetty Dunn, and who was, of course, the, the museum director at the time, and Nancy Bartlett, who was president of the Historical Society at the time. And one thing just led to another. And I don't know about you all, but that is why I am here tonight. This question is not for you. It is for me. How dry can we be when we talk about the ancestral Pueblo people? I can stand up here and I can tell you about the migration, the years that it occurred, the coalition period and the classical period of the Pueblos, the pottery, the Tewa speaking people, the Kiri speaking people, and within about five minutes I can put you all to sleep. Because I tell it like a historian. And that is the wrong way to tell the ancestral Pueblo story. And the reason I know that is two people. One is Chris Judson. Many of you know her as a longtime ranger at Bandelier National Monument, a wonderful resource for this community in many ways, a wonderful teacher. And Chris has almost absorbed Bandelier in the many decades that she has worked down there. And she tells this story wonderfully and in a way that is musical and emotional, not sort of the dry dates and bricks. And then, a couple of years ago, in our volunteer training, we asked a gentleman from Jemez Pueblo, Marlon Magdalena, to come and train our volunteers about the ancestral Pueblo people. And Marlon, even more than Chris, is just almost mystical and magical with the stories of the Pueblo. And he doesn't talk about how they came here. He talks about how they are here. And he incorporates music, and he incorporates what's happening now and what's happened back then. And he ties it all together in this beautiful story. And so I would argue that our museum needs to add an element of enchantment to the story that the Pueblos themselves have. How do we do that? Well, that's very easy. We need to build better relationships with our neighbors. It's something that we just started a tiny piece of a few months ago when we opened the exhibit Adams and Art about Maria Martinez and Bernice Broad. We invited folks uh, to come up from San Ildefonso to bless that exhibit. They did, as well as the governor of the Pueblo. And it was the beginning of a new relationship. And the governors of the Pueblos change frequently, but that's OK. We need to keep pursuing, and we need to keep making friends, and we need to keep understanding that our stories are woven together. And so that is a charge I leave you with. This picture, while making me smile, makes me cry, because about half the folks in it have subsequently passed away. Uh, Ray Gonzalez, the gentleman in the yellow shirt and the brown jacket right here. We just lost him just a couple of months ago. He is, of course, the son of Bensis and was a just um, wonderful asset to the Historical Society for many years. Grandson of Victor Romero, he and his brother Severo, who's just cut off in the photo over there, helped us as we interpreted the cabin. And the cabin has given us incredible opportunities that we did not have before to, again, meet with our neighbors, to talk with people from the valley who had connections up here during the Homestead era, to work with these stories of people who were separated from their homes and lost their land, and yet, at the same time, were able to come into the Manhattan Project and change the entire environment of northern New Mexico. This cabin is open occasionally. We have a wonderful volunteer. Sherry, where are you? Way back there some. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Who is Mrs. McDougall, a neighbor of the Romeros, and tells our visitors, as she is dressed as Mrs. McDougall, what it was like to be here as a homesteader. We have a couple of students who volunteer for us. But it would be wonderful for our visitors to have this cabin open every day in the summer. It is really easy to volunteer in there. All you have to do is sit and wait for, for visitors to come. So. I would encourage you, if you've got some time this summer, just come spend a few hours at the cabin, come meet some visitors, and share that homestead story that we have, uh, that we need to share with our visitors. Whoops. So, speaking of sharing stories, I am so pleased to report 
that the Homestead book that was written several years ago by Judy Machen, Ellen McGee, and Dorothy Horde is going to be republished. Hopefully, it will be this summer. I just learned today the corrections have gone to Mark Rayburn, our graphic designer. And he says, a month, maybe six weeks. And then our printer has told us eight to 10 weeks. And so we will have a book signing and we will have a big celebration to celebrate this book coming back out. When it was first published, it was done by the laboratory and it was given to the Homestead Descendants and the copy that I have under lock and key, I think the copies are missing from Mesa Public Library. That's how uh, precious this book is. So uh, it's gonna be great to have the new edition. This woman is probably my favorite homesteader. And we don't do a good enough job telling her story. Cassie, as you can see, was a brave, adventuring, daring woman. The picture on the right, notice the little pistol that is on the pillow there with her. Cassie had been in that beautiful white gown that she's in, right? Cassie had been uh, dared by one of her friends to spend the night in a cave eight. And she took that pistol that she borrowed from a friend with her to make sure that if any rattlesnakes or bobcats or anything came along, she could get rid of them. She said she was actually more scared of the pistol than she was any of the critters. Cassie named Los Alamos. The little ranch that was here that the Los Alamos Ranch School was built on belonged to Cassie and Harold Brooke, and Cassie's the one who named their little spread. Nobody in town knows Cassie's story. So we need to get that out there and we need to make sure that we are like Cassie and that we are daring and sassy and do things like sleep in cave eights at night. <laughs> so what the Homestead story reminds us is that history is complicated. And two years ago, we stood in this room for the New Mexico Museum Association meeting and an elder from Santa Clara Pueblo came and gave a blessing. And as he was speaking, he said, at Santa Clara Pueblo and the other Pueblos, our parents were the unskilled labor on the Manhattan Project. Our, excuse me, our grandparents were the unskilled labor. Our parents became skilled labor during the Cold War. We became scientists and engineers. And with pride in his voice, he said, our children are becoming group leaders and division leaders. And that is an important story. It's an important connection to the valley. But there are other connections, because there are people who have been affected by land loss, people who have been affected by pollution. It's complicated. It's not always nice to talk about. But it's a story that needs to be told, and one that I think is a museum we can work on. We can continue to build relationships with our neighbors. We had a wonderful opportunity two years ago to go down to Northern New Mexico College in Española to this conference called Cuarencia Interrupted, Hispanos and Native American Experiences on the Manhattan Project. Talk about eye-opening. There are some very angry people. But on the other hand, there are people like Mr. Garcia who are very appreciative. And so where is the balance? Where are those stories? How do we bring those together and tell them as a museum and as an educational institution? It's about building those relationships. And we're working on that. Uh, when we had Tomas Romero come up from the Rio Grande Heritage area and speak last year, that was part of that. That's part of what we're trying to do. And that we need to continue. We need to take our programs to the valley. We need to have programs from the valley come here. One of the things that we are quite excited about is a uh, documentary that the laboratory has actually produced about the burning ground accident that occurred out at the, um, out at the laboratory at S site. May, many of you may remember several years ago, Kerry Skidmore came and spoke about his research into those accidents. After that talk, he met with many, many family members and he has spent hundreds of hours obtaining oral history videos and putting together a, an amazing documentary. He's actually going to be speaking on it for us next fall. And so those kinds of taking the time to meet people and to hear their stories, it's what we do as a museum and it's what we need to continue to do. I tell every visitor 
that I meet, whether in the museum or on tour, that the real reason we are all here is not the Manhattan Project. It is the Los Alamos Ranch School. It's my favorite story in Los Alamos history. Two years ago, in 2017, we celebrated the 200th, or excuse me, the 100th anniversary of the school. And Sharon Snyder, our publications director and board member, found a volunteer, and she and many other volunteers, including Sherry and others, got together and tracked down the 550 boys who were associated with the ranch school, whether that was the school itself or the summer camp that it occasionally held. And they found obituaries, and they found all kinds of really wonderful information. This gentleman, here he is at the ranch school. Here he is in this very room at the anniversary, is Jeremy Taylor. He was one of six surviving students that we were able to track down. Jeremy came to Los Alamos because he was quite sickly, actually. He was growing up in New Jersey, had a lot of colds. He came out here, he wore shorts no matter what the weather was, he slept on that screened porch at the big house, and he was not sick for the three years that he lived in Los Alamos. So, uh, quite a character. He still walks at age 96, is that right, Sharon? Yes. Yeah, at age 96, he still walks 10 miles every week because of lessons he learned at the Los Alamos Ranch School. Now, when researching these stories for the 100th anniversary, we did make a lot of discoveries. Many were great, what these young men went on to do, how they contributed to their communities, to the nation, and to the world, but we also learned some bad. In their book, Los Alamos, The Ranch School Years, Linda Aldrich and John Worth spent two pages discussing AJ's inappropriate behavior with boys at the school. They concluded that it was limited and that it did not affect the overall reputation or the community of the school itself. Robert Stewart, who would go on to become president of Quaker Oats and the ambassador to Norway under President Ronald Reagan, wrote a memoir of his life and of his time at the ranch school. He had many wonderful things to say. And then he said, I must say we sometimes wondered about AJ's judgment. For instance, he made us fall out at the break of day and if the weather was reasonable, do our exercises bare tail. Gore Vidal now speculates that there was prurient interest involved and I share that suspicion. As we were doing the research, one of our living students that we found is a gentleman named David Osborne. Osborne is a novelist and a movie script writer and quite a character. And David had an oral history interview with our curator, Don Cavanis. And what David said was, very few people have come right out and said it, but the simple fact was he was a screaming pedophile. We couldn't, he never actually got his hands on the boys, but he was forever ogling us in the showers and forever putting his hands on our thighs. The reaction of everybody, all of us at the time, I don't think anybody felt abused, although we clearly were. We were sexually abused in a sense. So what do we do with this information? AJ is dead, as are most of his victims. Is it any different than any other boys' school on the planet? Probably not. What does justice demand? I don't know that we know the answer to that question yet. We are talking with experts in this field. We are talking with oral historian experts and others to try and figure out how to handle this information. You may hear more about it moving forward, and you may not. But let's talk about something more pleasant. And that is this gentleman, finest of men and most learned, this is Lawrence Hitchcock, longtime headmaster of the Los Alamos Ranch School. One of the things that I have learned in the last few years, and part of it has been from coming to know Hitch's daughter, Jody Hitchcock Benson, Lawrence Hitchcock was one of the reasons, and really perhaps the driving force behind the reason that the Los Alamos Ranch School gained such a well-deserved reputation as a top-notch prep school. This man was brilliant. The masters he hired under him were as well. It was at a Lars reunion in 1970 that the students presented a Latin salutation to Hitch, who was the Latin instructor, along with many other languages that he spoke. And I'll just read you this part here. It says, Master Lawrence Hitchcock, finest of men and most learned, your students wish to do you the greatest honor. Fortune favors youth under your instruction. To you for such services we give greatest strength. Thanks, greatest thanks. 
And so he was very well loved by his students. But you see Hitch here in his World War II uniform. He was called up before uh, the school closed down. He went to Washington, D.C., where he worked with the Office of Strategic Services, which is, of course, the forerunner of the CIA. He was a colonel with them. And after the war, he was a CIA administrator who supervised the construction of the agency's headquarters in Langley, Virginia. From 1942 until 1947, Hitch served as the, this is a long title here, Secretary General of the Inter-American Defense Board, where his daughter says he was, his responsibility was to keep Central and South American countries from going communist. Now, we started researching history into these boys. And we found some really interesting ones. I'm going to share with you Francis Rousseau, who's one of my favorite students here at the ranch school. His father was the business manager for the school. And he is the only boy, as far as we know, who attained the rank of mountain scout, which is actually above Eagle Scout, and you can't get it anymore. Quite a bright young man and quite ambitious. And so we know about Hitch and his CIA connections. Listen to this written, um, this article. After World War II, Rousseau became vice president of Barso Company Limited for Latin America, spending time in Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. I've Googled Barso Company Limited. It doesn't exist. There is a company called Barso, but it's based in the UK, and it's a small family business, and started in the 1990s. You can't find anything about Barso Company Limited working in Central and South American countries. So, I'm not saying that Rousseau worked for the CIA, but I'm not saying he didn't. And I think it's definitely something worth looking into with these connections with Hitch. The big house. This story broke my heart for so many years because it got torn down. But when you see pictures of it like this and you look up close, it's really not in that great of shape. I have still not given the Atomic Energy Commission the benefit of the doubt for tearing this building down in 1947, but I'm working on it. <laughs> now, this is a very important building in Los Alamos history. You will note it was built in 1917. Ashley Pond invested $25,000 in 1917 to build it, and it was made of upright log construction. Very unusual. It inspired John Gamim to build this building with upright log construction. So who was the architect? We can tell you who it wasn't. We know, of course, it wasn't Meme because he wasn't in New Mexico and he wasn't an architect when it was built. Jesse Nesbaum and I.I. Rapp, who were famous Santa Fe architects in southern Colorado, it wasn't them because the timing isn't right. Sharon and I got real excited a few years ago because we were looking on Wikipedia and it Pond and Pond Architects. Ashley Pond's cousins were famous architects in Chicago. They built the Hall House, which is, of course, where Jane Addams was in such a famous part of, of American history. They built the, well, I guess they redecorated the Detroit Metropolitan Opera. These guys were very famous Midwestern architects. And right here on Wikipedia, it said they built the big house. Ah, finally, we thought. So we, uh, we called up the University of Michigan where the Pond's papers were, and they said, you know, said would you help us to find the, the information on when they built this? And it was built in 1917, and here's a picture of what it looks like. And they said, nothing, nothing, nothing. So we called up the Art Institute of Chicago, where the Pond and Pond drawings are held. And there's even a book that says there's a drawing in New Mexico. Yeah, it's a building in Santa Fe. Nothing about the big house. So. It probably wasn't Pond and Pond. We still haven't given up on Templeton Johnson, who was a good friend of the Ponds and who also was a very famous architect out of San Diego and helped design Balboa Park. So we haven't given up on him yet, but I'm going to give you a theory, and you can do what you want to with it. When Ashley and Hazel Pond were living down in Pajarito Canyon, and they had the Sportsman's Club down there, Hazel Pond took an architectural correspondence course. And they had a lot of famous friends who were architects. I think Hazel designed the big house, and I'm sticking to that. All right, so we come to the Manhattan Project. What more is there to say 
about the greatest gathering of scientific minds in history, the extraordinary life of those who lived here, the wonderful stories, the questions about the roles of science in society. I'm going to put Art Fried on the spot here. He, uh, he wonders often what more can be written, and yet more books are written every year, especially anniversary years like the one coming up. 2020 will be the 75th anniversary of the, uh, the end of the war. So what more can be said? Well, I'm going to say keep looking, because there's always new discoveries to make. This gentleman is Richard McFadden. He was here during the Manhattan Project as part of the Provisional Engineer Detachment. And he was the company clerk for his group. Of course, the Provisional Engineer Detachment were the guys who were building the roads and building the laboratories for the SEDs, the Special Engineer Detachment. But Richard had another very special job, and that is he ran the movie theater. Richard was an autograph hound from the time he was a teenager, and so to be here and to run the movie theater, he just thought was about the thrill of the lifetime for him. He had to make sure there were ushers, and he got to collect everybody's dimes, and, and he just loved that part of his job, and had a great experience in Los Alamos. Had no idea what anybody was doing up here, but boy did he have fun. This gentleman is Reed Cameron, who also has recently, just fairly last couple of months, passed away. Sharon and I drove eight hours to Grand Junction, Colorado, spent the night, spent about an hour and a half with Reed, drove back in a rainstorm on the Million Dollar Highway. I still have white knuckles. But people might say, you spent an hour and a half for a 16-hour drive, you know, is that really worth it? Let me tell you, the interview with Reed Cameron is priceless. And there's a couple of reasons why. You'll see the... Uh, the photo book that he's looking at there. There was a picture in that photo book of Reed tied to his bed and his bed tied to the top of a two-story barracks in Los Alamos. And we said, Reed, what is up with that? And he said, well, let me tell you. I may have had a little bit too much to drink one night. <laughs> and I took my skis. He was an avid skier. He had a big, big pair of skis. He said, I took my skis and I barricaded the door so that none of my buddies could get in the barracks. And so in revenge, they tied me to my bed and tied my bed up on top of the, the barracks. <laughs> you just can't buy stories like that. And then he took us into the garage and showed us those very same skis, which now that he has passed away, I do believe the family is going to be sending them here. So it's just, you know, to have, have the photo, the story, the skis all together to make that, that just wonderful story that, that you can't find anywhere else. We're losing them, obviously, at a very fast pace, more and more all the time. But there are going to be new discoveries. There are diaries sitting in attics. There are letters sitting in basements. And those are going to continue to come to us. And so there are always going to be more stories to tell. General Leslie Groves deserves more credit than he, des than he gets for the Manhattan Project. Los Alamos has an Oppenheimer Drive and an Oppenheimer condo. There is even a Hoppenheimer IPA over at Bathtub Row Brewing. <laughs> Richland, Washington has General Leslie Groves Park. We don't have anything for General Groves. Was General Groves a difficult person to work with? Yes, yes, he was. Was he abrasive and demanding? Yes, he was. Would the Manhattan Project have been successful without him? Probably not. So I think we need to, as a community, yeah, his sculpture is out here, but it doesn't really say anything, and we need to say more. What can we name after him? What can we do? I honestly think that Bathtub Row Brewing is missing a huge opportunity here because they could have a Groves Stout, or even better, a Stout Groves. <laughs> All right, and finally, about the Manhattan Project. If you have a hankering in your heart to write a fiction book, please don't. <laughs> no, seriously, about three years ago, I was asked to review a fiction book about the Manhattan Project, and I was quite, quite intrigued with the plot. I really did want to read this book. And 30 pages into it, I had to put it down, and I said, that's it. I am not doing any more Manhattan Project. Between the television show 
and the book I just and, and the green glass see what authors do that they don't need to do is they they distort the facts. You are talking about one of the most dramatic stories in history. You don't need to distort the facts. You don't need to have the protagonist of The Green Glass Sea, which is an otherwise pretty decent book about a girl who lives here during the Manhattan Project having a picnic at Trinity three days after the blast. That's just dumb. <laughs> and so I guess if you are going to write a fiction book about the Manhattan Project, I would just urge you, get your facts right. The, the particular book that I was reading was talking about, oh, people just coming and going in and out of the gate all the time, going back east for whatever they wanted to do, going down to Albuquerque. It's like, no, that didn't happen. And there's a reason it didn't happen. And, and you're taking away the, the, the way the people lived here and what it was and what their stories were when you put that fiction in there. So just don't do it. So we move into the Cold War. The Cold War has been a, an interesting challenge for us at the museum. We, of course, acquired the Hans Bethe House a few years ago with the intent of putting in Cold War exhibits. And we did that to an extent. When you're creating an exhibit, what you do is you first look at the scholarly information, what books have been written, what articles. And then you distill that down, and you start writing your panels. And then you look at what you've got in your collection, what sort of objects and what sort of oral history interviews and you bring all of this together and you, you distill it down into an exhibit. And we said, great, we finally have 1,400 square feet to talk about 70 years of post-war history in Los Alamos at the Hans Bethe House. Let's go do this. We start looking at the literature. Thousands of books have been written about the Cold War, and about two of them talk about the history of Los Alamos. All of those books are talking about Washington and Moscow and geopolitical history. So it was a struggle for us to find the scholarship, and we said, huh. Well, we'll have to do this ourselves. And so we did, through some generous donations from our membership, we were able to hire a scholar who has started, well, has been reading newspapers and magazines. And uh, there was Samuel Bulow, who, of course, gave our talk a couple of months ago. And he's narrowed down some themes. And we are developing a new exhibit that is going to be in the rotating gallery this summer. And then we will expand that exhibit to move it into the Hans Bethe House. And it is about Los Alamos from essentially 1947 until 1970. You can consider that the Bradbury years. And the title of the exhibit is Los Alamos Became a Normal Community. You're supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> that was a laughing point. So what, what is normal? So you're looking at 1950s and 60s America, and you think, OK, leave it to Beaver, and father knows best, right? That is what we think about, most of us, who are thinking about the 50s and 60s in this way. Well, you look at Los Alamos, and yes, it was ethnically white for the most part. It was economically middle class for the most part. It was civically suburban, even though there was no big city nearby. But you look at housing. Nothing normal about housing in Los Alamos, where Norris Bradbury himself said, you can't own a piece of the American dream. Nothing normal about parents going off to the Nevada test site and coming back and going off again constantly. Nothing normal about not talking about work at home, which of course happened during the Manhattan Project as well. Nothing normal about having a business that the government told you what that business could be, and there's no competition because you've got the only jewelry store in town. The idea of, during the Manhattan Project, they couldn't leave, so they created their own entertainment. That very much has stayed around. We have this fabulous arts community with our little theater and our um, arts center and all of just these really wonderful organizations came about. Either the government pays for it or we do it ourselves. And so it's a very different mindset. And there is nothing normal about Los Alamos, so that's what we're going to talk about in our Cold War exhibits. As Art Fried would say, what more is there to say about Robert Oppenheimer? And yet, I bet you a couple of new biographies come out next year. He was very complicated, and I think we all know that and understand that. He was brilliant, and someday there is going to be a whole section of our museum devoted to him. Because, of course, through the generosity of Helene and Jerry Sudam, the Oppenheimer House is owned by the Los Alamos Historical Society. What is that museum going to look like? Well, I can promise you 
It will not be your typical historic house museum, where you walk in and a docent shows you the furniture behind the velvet rope, because we don't have any of Oppenheimer's furniture. And even if we did, wouldn't that be a travesty to his intellectual legacy? Oppenheimer was a brilliant man, and he asked big questions. So let's be like that. Let's ask big questions. What is it like to be the father of the atomic bomb? What does it mean to be a patriot? And that is a question we want to explore. I just, again, want to thank um, Helene for her many, many years of volunteer service at the Historical Society for the, the gift of the home. And she's also been very generous with us. And as we've been planning this museum, she's like, yes, I want to know what you're going to do. And she's, she's engaged with us in, in these stories. And, and she wants to, to make sure that Oppenheimer gets taken care of. And so the fact that the man who was on the cover of Time Magazine in 1946 as the hero who had won World War II, and yet eight years later is stripped of his security clearance in an illegal kangaroo court by the Atomic uh, Energy Commission, we have to talk about that, and we have to tell our nation what happened. And again, ask that question, what does justice demand? This is one of those things that uh, I hope someday I have great-great-grandchildren sitting on my lap and I can say, I was there when a national park was created. I think the establishment of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park was probably the most frustrating and rewarding part of this job. We worked on it for a decade. We had meetings in the halls of Congress. We had meetings with congressional staffs. We actually, I was able to testify in front of Congress, which was a remarkable experience. And then we waited. And we waited for many years, and we watched many hearings go on. And, and poor Bob, I'd be sitting in on the computer at night watching C-SPAN go on, is it going to go? Is it going to go? And it just happened year after year. Finally, in 2014, it did. And this was in 2015, November 10th. This was the signing of the park. It's Secretary Jewell, uh, Secretary of the Interior here, and Secretary Moniz, Secretary of Energy here, signing the documents that actually birthed the park. We had a two-day scholar forum ahead of that, which was just an amazing experience, uh, talking with people from the different communities, and, and uh, even uh, there were representatives from Hiroshima and Nagasaki there. And um, it was just, it made me proud to be an American to be there that day, and to see firsthand the political and historical processes that I had studied all of my adult life actually come to fruition. I would like to uh, like you all to welcome with us tonight Chris Kirby, the superintendent of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. Chris, where are you? She's back in the back. <laughs> so what is happening with the park. Our park is four years old now, if you can believe that, four years. And what do we see? We have a small visitor contact station with one staff and a small cadre of volunteers. That's here in Los Alamos, and it's pretty much the same at the other sites. So what can we expect? The park would like to do an interpretive plan. That's going to frame what their exhibits look like. But Chris got a $75,000 funding cut this year, so she's down a little bit. She can't say all this stuff. I can, <laughs> so I'm going to. Um, they are working on a collecting plan, and part of that collecting plan is going to say that they're not going to, that we and, the, um, that, and agencies in Oak Ridge and Hanford will be collecting for them, and so they'll borrow stuff out of our archives. We are working on a new agreement with the Park Service where in our museum shop we will sell Manhattan Project um, National Park Service related items. We get to keep the money from that, and in return, they get our photographs and those kinds of things. They need more staffing. They need more programs. They need more volunteers to do those things. And just remember, as I like to say, Yosemite was not built in a day. It is the wonderful park that we know and love today after more than 100 years. And so let's, let's give our park a little bit of time, but let's also help our park. Let's contact our representatives and our senators and say, fund the park. Because what Congress did when they created the park, they created about five or six parks that same year. The Interior Department budget did not increase a cent. 
And so they have to set up these new parks, but they don't have any additional funding for it. And so let's give our park a hand and let's let our representatives and congresspeople and senators know that the park needs money. All of these people are heroes. The men, the women who worked on the Manhattan Project, whether it was serving dinner to the scientists down at Odaway Bridge, greeting them as they came into 109 East Palace. I love the story about Deke Parsons sticking his, like a camel, sticking his uh, nose into everything that was going on. And there are people that will tell us that these are not heroes. And don't let them do that. Here's why. All of us need to read these two books. Now, I will admit, the book on the right, no, it's not read yet. It's in the stack, which is only about that high right now. But I have listened to the author speak on this book a couple of times. And what it is, it's an economic and military history of the United States at the end of the war. And they argue that President Truman wasn't just faced with bringing home American boys from Japan. They say that when the war was over in Europe, Americans had a kind of a big collective sigh. Ah, we're done. But of course, we weren't done. We still had the Pacific. And so there's this feeling in America that the war's over, but Truman is sending thousands and thousands of men to the Pacific. There's economic pressures. The Great Depression is long over, and people have been working like crazy in the war industries, and they're making money. They have nothing to spend it on, and they don't think they're making enough money. The unions are starting to grumble. And so this book explains the economic pressures and the political pressures that are facing Truman at the end of 1944, beginning of 1945. The book on the left, I have read, and it's probably one of the best books I have read about World War II. Richard Frank talks about the political and military histories of both the United States and Japan at the end of the war. And what he explains that many of the revisionist historians did not know when they were writing their books in the 80s was that we had broken the Japanese military code as well as the Japanese diplomatic code. And so he is revealing all kinds of new information. Now this book is 20 years old now, but at the time it was quite new. And the Japanese had a strategy called Getsu Go, which was we are going to inflict as much damage on the Americans as possible so that they will surrender on better terms. We know we have to surrender, but if we can get some of the terms that we want, if we make things so miserable for them when they come to Okinawa, when they come to Iwo Jima, when they come to the home islands, if we make it so bad, then we can get better surrender terms. So that was their strategy. They had 7,000 planes in reserve for the invasion of the home islands. But we had broken that code, and we knew that we were in for a fight. As a result of that, and as a result of what had happened in Okinawa, with just the horrendous loss of life, there was some infighting in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Essentially, Nimitz, Chester W. Nimitz, the Admiral of the Pacific Fleet, had taken the brunt of what happened at Okinawa. The kamikazes inflicted horrendous damage, and the casualties were horrible for the Navy. He did not want to invade Japan. MacArthur, on the other hand, I want to go win the war. So he was ready to do that. So there was some internal fighting. One of the things that Frank points out that many, many of us have forgotten is that, yes, there were American prisoners of war, but there were thousands of Asians living under Japanese rule in horrible, cruel circumstances. And the end of the war, the swift end of the war, changed things for them as well. And finally, another thing he says is, well, basically what he points out over and over is that the Japanese military was never going to surrender. And many of you know, there was a coup. The night the emperor made the recording 
that was to be broadcast when the surrender came about. There was an army coup. It was unsuccessful. But they were going to essentially imprison the emperor, the army was, and be, for his own good, of course, and, and continue on with the war. This book has the documentation to prove that the Japanese were not going to surrender. And this is what makes me angry. What makes me implore you to remember that those folks in that earlier picture from the Manchester and their stories and their number one goal to bring a swift end to World War II. Every year on August 6th and again on August 9th, there are hundreds if not dozens of stories about the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now I am not saying that those anniversaries should not be remembered. Absolutely they should be. We should always be reminded of the horrors of atomic bombs. But when it comes to the anniversary of the end of World War II, the bloodiest conflict in the history of the world, there is practically silence. I'm sorry, you can't see that. There were three stories last year. That's the big news. The war was over. Let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate that that war was over. Let's not let that just fall by the wayside. This is Colonel Albert, Lieutenant Colonel Albert Reed. He had this picture taken in Australia in 1943 and he sent it to his wife. This is Colonel Reed after going through the Philippines as a anti-aircraft gunner, receiving the Bronze Star from General Case in March of 1945. This is the diary that Lieutenant Colonel Reed kept during the war. He was assisting with the planning of the invasion of Japan, and as a member of the 6th Army, he received his orders for the invasion on July 28th of 1945. As an anti-aircraft gunner, he was expected to be one of the first on the beach. On August 8th of 1945, in his diary, Lieutenant Colonel Reed wrote, news of the atomic bomb is now the big topic of conversation. We all hope that it will make an early surrender. Spent the day in my office. On August 10th, he wrote, what a week. Japan's peace offer came over the radio at about 0900 while Gentry and I were playing Dirty Eights, which is a card game that he favored. Everybody celebrated and how. It was drunk out. So the next day he wrote several headaches this morning. <laughs> we stay pretty close to the radio, got news of our counteroffer to Japan. We should know by Monday. Finally, after several days of waiting, on August 15th, Colonel Reed wrote, This is it. Japan accepted our peace terms. I heard the news at 08.15, 6.15 p.m., 14 August, in Kansas. Because Lieutenant Colonel Reed was from Kansas, he was the son of a hardware store owner in a small town. Lieutenant Colonel Reed stayed with the Army after the war, became a full bird colonel, and in fact ran the office of the Army Corps of Engineers in Albuquerque. He built Abiquiu Dam and the Hamas Dam, which is a water retention structure that nobody knows about, but it does exist. He had a son born after the war who attended Albuquerque Academy and New Mexico State University. And you've probably figured out by now, Colonel Reed was my grandfather. I like hundreds of thousands of other Americans, including my husband's family, can tell the story of how my father or grandfather or great, great, we're even I think working on three greats now for some generations, did not have to participate in the invasion of Japan. Yes, it came at a horrible cost and no one should deny that. But how much greater could those costs have been? My granddad, that I played a lot of dirty eights with, he called it crazy eights by the time I was little, um, he was the greatest man I ever knew. And 
he's one of the reasons that Los Alamos, the Los Alamos story is so important to me and to so many like me. So your charge tonight, as I leave, is to continue to learn the Los Alamos stories, to gather them, to protect them, and to share them. Now, new adventures await. My husband and I plan to spend the next three years traveling and exploring the world, hiking, diving, staying in warm places. <laughs> I'll be starting a new business where I will be uh, doing some freelance writing and some editing and consulting, and I really hope to consult with a, a national park. Um, but mostly, I have to say to all of you, thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. It has been an honor to share this with you. Thank you for allowing me to give this talk, and I'm sorry. Thank you for allowing me to have all of these wonderful years at the Los Alamos Historical Society with all the fantastic support of this community because this has truly been a labor of love. Prior to that, we had had a, a counter on the floor, and when people walked through the door, it counted them, and so we divided it in half because they'd go in and out. But if someone left their purse in the car, they'd run back and get it. Uh, little boys who heard the buzzing would start jumping up and down on it. So there were all <laughs> kinds of, of things. And so, so our numbers that we had at the museum were actually higher than when we reopened and started charging admission. However, we have seen throughout the community um, the Bradbury Science Museum, which is keeping the same numbers they always have, the Visitor Center, everybody has seen those numbers go up. So we, we think our numbers are also up, it's just the way we're counting is different. And so uh, we had hoped all along that the National Park would provide this. You put that you know, beautiful badge on something and it attracts people. And then the fact that we are partners with the park, and so the rangers and the volunteers there say, you know, go visit the Bradbury, go visit the History Museum, and, and learn about our community. So it's been a real boon to us, which was one of the reasons we wanted to redo the museum. We wanted it to be a world-class museum for our visitors to, to match our park. Thank you, Heather, for everything you do. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to frame this question, but you don't know what I'm saying. At what point in your life, how old were you, when you kind of made the connection of your grandpa being in World War II and he was going to be invading Japan, and then you're up here where the Manhattan Project happened? Was it when you met Bob, maybe? Or at what point in your life did you make that connection? Oh, that's a really good question that I'm not sure I have an answer to because you know I grew up with a story that honestly I thought was apocryphal and that is my dad always said that my granddad had his orders for the invasion in his pocket when he learned about the, um, the atomic bomb and I was like no, I bet he didn't. But then I read Richard Frank's book, and it says they did receive their orders on July 28th. And knowing my granddad, he probably did have his orders in his pocket. So that was always something with me. And But I grew up in, well, I was born in Crucis and, and 
mentioned my dad at New Mexico State. Yeah, that's what. <laughs> and then I ended up graduating from high school in Gallup. And, you know, everybody else in New Mexico doesn't know anything about Los Alamos and thinks it's kind of a weird place, which it kind of is, as we talked about for the Cold War, right? But, um, so I never really thought about Los Alamos as a place or as anything other than, yeah, just a bunch of scientists live there and I don't know what they do. And, you know, and then, you know, Bob and I met, but Los Alamos wasn't really a topic until schools. Ah, we're not going to raise our kids in Florida where the schools are terrible. We're going to take them to Los Alamos where they're good. And so it was probably some time as I was, you know, here and said, oh, Fuller Lodge. Gosh, you know, imagine a table at lunchtime during the Manhattan Project. And that was kind of when I, so it was probably the building itself that again brought me to that, that realization. Now that I'm talking through it with you and sharing my entire life story. <laughs> so, there you go. So I think for us, really, the big thing was when we were at, uh, at Pearl Harbor. It really brought everything together at the beginning and the end of World War II. I think that was a pretty important part of the whole thing. Yeah, that was an amazing experience because I was already working for the museum when the first time we visited Pearl Harbor. And to be there and kind of be there at the beginning and realize that Los Alamos had brought about the end was a, a really moving and remarkable experience. Other questions? Chris has one. I just want to say, on behalf of the National Park Service and really the American public, thank you so much for your commitment and dogged resolution and passion in getting this park created. I know you're one of the key players, and I think it's it's really amazing, as I've had this job, all the people that I've met that were so dedicated to making sure that we give a, you know shine a light on this pivotal moment in American world history. So thank you, because you're definitely one of those key players, and you kind of you know, your name is on, the, is on the building at the end of the film, who created this park, so that's not really known. <laughs> um, I, just, I just wanted to make sure the National Park Service gave you a hearty thank you. And I just, I personally really appreciate your partnership, your dedication. I love our conversations, and I love just, you know, as you mentioned, we have limited resources, and so it's all about partnership being creative. And thank you for being willing to lean in and help us, help us move the needle. I really appreciate it. Thank you. No heckling from Todd Batch. <laughs> Good news. Yes. Thank you. Oh, well, it's got it. Ron, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they're good luck and good fortune, and we'll be looking forward to reading your blogs. But do you have a suggestion of what we should do about Groves and how to honor him? We have the portrait in the museum and of course the sculpture, but beyond that. And also, um, Deke Parsons. How can we honor Deke? Most people don't know, and Los Alamos know of his contribution. That's true, and I'm, I'm hopeful that when, you know, there, there is some rumor out there that Deacon Street behind C.B. Fox was named for Deke Parsons. Probably not. Uh, but maybe we can do something there for Deke Parsons. Deacon Street, that's where he got that nickname from since his last name was Parsons. So, so I think there's maybe something there for Deke. I don't know about General Groves, other than you know the beer. Uh, but maybe there is something more permanent that we can do. The, the beautiful park along the river in Richland that is named after General Groves is just a, a wonderful place. So you know, maybe there's a place. One of the things that many people do not know about General Groves is that he was a wonderful family man. When his grandchildren were here for the sculpture dedication, they just raved about their granddad. And I said, oh, your granddad was with the Army Corps of Engineers, and he won World War II. And my granddad was with the Army Corps of Engineers, and he won World War II. So we have a lot in common. <laughs> but uh, they, they just humanized him so much. And that's what we need to understand, is that General Groves was a human. So maybe there's a family-friendly park that we can name for him, or something like that. But, uh, but definitely keep something in mind for honoring him. Urban Park needs a new name. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you again, everyone. It's just really been a fun.